My name is Dr. Larry Nigerian. I am the president of the Armenian American Health Professionals Organization. Today's program is part of a continuing series where we try to give you and provide with to you all of the facts that you need to deal with the coronavirus pandemic. We are very blessed today to have three amazing speakers. The first is Dr. Celine Kojoglanyan. She is a board certified professor of infectious disease and pediatrics. She has been dealing with this COVID pandemic from the very beginning, sits on various strategic committees regarding the pandemic response in New York, and has contributed to original research to peer reviewed journals. Dr. Kim Akimian is an expert in public health at the Vagula School of Medicine. And from the very beginning, even before the first patient died of COVID-19, Dr. Akimian has been warning us of the challenges that we face throughout this pandemic. We're also very, very fortunate to have Dr. Ani Nelbandian with us. Dr. Nelbandian is a cardiology fellow who's been treating acutely ill COVID-19 patients in the intensive care unit at the Vagula School of Medicine. She too has contributed original research to our body of knowledge regarding the coronavirus and its impact on our health. Before beginning, I would also like to take a moment and express our sympathies to everyone who has had the misfortune of being touched by the coronavirus. Uh, you're in our thoughts and in our prayers. The Armenian American Health Professionals Organization is a multifaceted 501c3 medical charity. And today's program is a very critical part of our mission in order to provide healthcare awareness, increased disease prevention, and early detection, foster fellowship and career development of Armenian healthcare professionals, and provide medical support and education both to our local communities and in Armenia. Throughout this program, we encourage you to send in your questions at info at oppo.org. And for those of you that already did send in your questions, rest be assured, we've reviewed them and we'll get to them today. If you have additional questions during the program, you can also put them in the chat. It is really with gratitude um, that we are here today. Uh, we are very grateful to our members and our colleagues, our social workers, our psychologists, our intensivists, anesthesiologists, uh, dentists and physicians who've been on the front lines of this crisis from the very beginning. They have been instrumental in helping improve our survival. We are also very grateful to the basic researchers, the clinicians who publish papers and help us study and learn more about the coronavirus. So we too can uh, have a better chance at survival. One of the most important parts of our organization are our pillars, our strengths. It's our willingness to help. We also wanna thank our donors who've been with us for 26 years, contributing to our cause to help us educate the community. Uh, we are also very fortunate to have community support from many of the nonprofit community in the Armenian uh, circles, including the Armenian General Benevolent Union, the Armenian Medical, the Armenian Missionary Association of America, the Eastern Diocese and many of its churches, Fund for Armenian Relief, the Karagoshian Foundation, the Knights of Vartan, the Armenian Radio Hour, and Voice of Armenians. Without your critical assistance, we wouldn't be able to get the message out as we have throughout this pandemic. Thank you very much to all, each and every one of you. I now want to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Kim McKeemian. She's an assistant professor of nutrition and pediatric Institute of Human Nutrition, an associate director of education at the program for global and population health at the Vagilus College of Physician and Surgeons. We're also very happy to have her as a board member of APO. Dr. Akimian, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for everything that you've done throughout the beginning of this pandemic. I'm going to be talking to you today about where we are in the state of the pandemic here in the United States. I'm not going to be giving you a global perspective, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the vaccine rollout, why it's a little bit messy, and why we hope that it's going to get better in the future. I will be followed by Dr. Tsolin Kojaolanyan, who is an infectious disease specialist, and she will discuss with you how the vaccines work and what their efficacy and safety are. 
And then uh, Dr. Larry Najarian will come back and discuss the process of the vaccine development and answer your questions about how it was developed and how it has ongoing monitoring of its safety. And finally, we're thrilled today to introduce Anin Albandian, who is a heart disease specialist at Columbia, who will be discussing with you issues of COVID and heart disease, other chronic illnesses, and giving you a perspective, um, a frontline view um, perspective from her work in the ICU and critical care unit it at Columbia. So where are we in the pandemic today? This is a map from the New York Times. They have a very interactive graphic for those of you who are not familiar with it, where you can scroll over your county anywhere in the United States to see the data from your county. As you can see, most of the United States has an extremely high risk for uh, infection transmission um, based on the number of positive cases and that percentage of positive cases uh, over the totality of the, of the tests being uh, conducted in the county. I can show you that the risk has gone up from September till today in much of the country. And that is in part due to the winter, in part due to the holidays. Um, we had a, an outbreak here in Bergen County among one of our church communities. Um, from the Armenian Christmas holidays. And so you're going to be starting to hear more and more about, uh, about people that you, that you know um, and, and you yourself may have also been uh, recently infected. So what are the ways that you can protect yourself and others? At this point, indoor activities are considered extremely dangerous right now. Um, please avoid on non-essential travel and uh, please avoid events with more than a handful of people, um, particularly as we now move into the, uh, what is anticipated to be an increase in infection rates with new, more infectious variants of the virus that you'll be hearing more about in this webinar. And this is my last graph I wanna show you. Again, this is by the COVID Tracking Project, which uh, works with an organization called Resolve to Save Lives and Johns Hopkins University for um, data tracking. And you can see here that, again, tests have gone up. Actual cases are just starting to come down a little bit. These are the number of average weekly hospitalized in the US. And then lastly, we have the deaths um, and the, uh, you can see that while we can report and you might see headlines about cases decreasing, look at the difference in where we are as a baseline now that we're saying that we're having reductions in cases versus where we were in the first wave in the spring. So this means that we have a really a very um, urgent situation and we urgently need to do something to intervene to mitigate. How can we end this pandemic? Well, the three pillars are prevention, diagnosis, and treatment for any illness or disease, right? And um, while you're going to hear a little bit more from the clinicians on the call about a diagnosis and treatment, and you're certainly welcome to ask questions, really the biggest bang for the buck here is to prevent the onset of the illness. And you'll be learning about why that is in, in the further presentations. But here I wanna say that around the world in the United States and by different states, counties, municipalities, we have varying mitigation efforts, policies that are put in place, these policies are often very detrimental to the economy and to local small businesses. And um, we are trying to utilize any policy that we can to encourage the prevention and preventative behaviors such as masks, social distancing and frequent hand hygiene. This really is all we had until this month really when we have another tool in the kit for prevention which is the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. Uh, we have two currently as you know um, uh, that are approved and uh, we may soon have a third approved here in the United States. So really this webinar is going to focus on your questions about the vaccine but I hope that you can tell with the graphs that I showed you before that really vaccine is going to be one of the most important tools that we have to reduce transmission, to reduce serious illness, to reduce hospitalizations, and therefore to reduce deaths from this virus. So if vaccine is so important, how come it's so messy to get, vaccine is one thing, but then vaccination is a whole other thing, right? So we have a little bit of a bumpy rollout with the vaccine. As you know, this is being done by a state by state 
uh, and sometimes within state county by county um, organizational uh, uh, system. So this is, I'm just putting up New Jersey's just since I'm in New Jersey uh, and there are many of you on the call in New Jersey as well. For those of you who have not, you can go through covidvaccine.nj.gov or look for your COVID vaccine for your state and then register for, a, you know, register with a survey that will end up determining what phase you are in for vaccines. So right now, currently in New Jersey, for example, uh, we have um, healthcare workers, the residents and staff of long-term um, care facilities, first responders, and um, individuals over 65. And then we have individuals with certain medical conditions. Those medical conditions determine have been determined to be associated with more severe risk and death. So they are now being prioritized. Many of you on this call fit within this and have not yet been able to get an appointment. And we understand that we are frustrated ourselves as well. This is because we have much greater demand than we have supply. So I can tell you that just for New Jersey, for example, we have the ability to distribute close to half a million doses of the vaccine each week. We have really ramped up the number of places that can vaccinate you, but we're only receiving 100,000 doses each week. And so there, until then, as supply increases and as some people get vaccinated and that demand slows, we will have a balance between supply and demand. And Governor Murphy, for example, has indicated that he hopes that we will reach 70% of the um, adult population who wants to be vaccinated to get vaccinated by the um, by June. So that is the goal. So if those of you who are very frustrated, hang tight, it's going to improve. Um, this is my last slide before I turn it over. I'm just putting this up there from the CDC to show you that again, vaccines are one of the tools to prevent the COVID pandemic. Whether or not you are vaccinated, the only way at this point to prevent Transmission is by continuing to wear masks in public and by continuing to stay distant from other people. This is true even for those of you who have managed to get the vaccine and that will be described to you by our next speaker who is Dr. Tsolin Kojaholanyan. She is board certified pediatric infectious disease specialist and associate professor of pediatrics and infectious disease diseases at Maimonides Children's Hospital here in New York and one of our OPPO executive board members. And with that, I will pass the baton and I look forward to answering the questions from webinar attendants at the end of these four presentations. Thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you for the introduction. So I'm going to be speaking about some COVID-19 updates, focusing mostly on the vaccine today. I do not have any financial relations to disclose to any of these companies that we are going to be talking about today. So that's something I want to make very clear. And the perspective, I think, for me, visuals is very important. So this number, for example, if we look at it now, you will see that we have at least 25 million people infected in the United States right now with COVID-19, and half a million of those people people who were infected have died from COVID-19. On the other hand, in the USA, we have about 25 million vaccinated with the COVID vaccine, so almost the same, and we have zero causally related deaths. So I hope that that gives you a, a perspective as to um, what, what we are looking at here. So um, as uh, Dr. Hekimian mentioned, there is a vaccine supply demand mismatch that we hope is going to get better. And I also want to say that um, Everything we're experiencing so far, including doctors, scientists, and uh, everybody else, this is real-time experience. We are looking at real-time, real-world data. And if anything, with this virus, everything changes almost on a daily basis. So the information we're presenting to you today is pertinent up to today, the Jan January th uh, 31st, 2021. Um, and uh, we want you guys to uh, speak to your trusted, knowledgeable doctors. We are here giving you the best knowledge and information we have, but we are not your primary physicians. We want you to speak to really people who know this, who have read the literature, you know, not the next door chiropractor who has some opinions about this. This, it takes, it has taken me 15 years to, you know, to, to study viruses. So I uh, wanna make sure that you guys have uh, trusted uh, physicians you can talk to. And then uh, lastly, stop, Let's all stop the spread of the virus and, and, and minimize the spread of uh, misinformation. 
That said, uh, uh, I like this quote from a, a, a physician who said that a virus is a piece of bad news wrapped up in protein. Uh, uh, so this is actually a schematic of what we're talking about. So this is the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. The bad news is the genetic code inside and the proteins are what the virus assembles together so that it can invade our cells and cause it, cause it a lot of damage and death. And for this particular virus, I want you guys to focus on the red spike protein because it's gonna be relevant for all the next slides that we're going to be talking about. So uh, for us to um, uh, control a viral infection, we have a defense system. I call it our military if you want. So for example, antibodies are one of our defense systems that prevent uh, the spike protein in the case of SARS-CoV-2 from attaching to the receptors on, on the human cell and entering the human cell. So antibodies can be gotten in two ways. They can be gotten by natural infection. So somebody gets infected with the virus, but unfortunately for a small percentage of people, by the time the, our antibodies are made, our dense, that defense system is revved up, it is too late. As you can see here, this is a fascinating real patient cell, which is magnified, of course, by an electron microscope. And these are the yellow things on it are the viruses that have basically attached to this cell and it is too late to salvage this cell, right? So the immune system has to kick in in a timely fashion for us to prevent the, the virus from attaching, entering, multiplying and attaching to other cells and multiplying again and again and again. So the idea with the vaccine is that we're going to form our defense system in advance. We're going to prepare our military, if you want, in advance so that when the virus comes in, we are ready and we're not like uh, scrambling to, to form antibodies and other parts of our immune system. And one concept, again, is important is that the virus, in order for it to attack and cause damage and disease, it has to be intact, right? It has to have the full genetic code, the full uh, um, uh, proteins, so those the full construct. Just pieces of the virus itself cannot cause disease. The disease has to be intact uh, in a particular configuration for it to cause disease. So the vaccine platforms that we're going to be talking about uh, today uh, that are uh, in the market or are almost going to be in the market are either protein based or viral vector based or messenger RNA based. And as I said, the spike protein is going to be an important protein in all of these because it's the one that the virus uses to attach to our cells and get into our cells. So again, we're going to prepare our defense in advance and make sure that we have already antibodies against the spike protein ready to go as soon as we get infected. So uh, the protein-based vaccines basically take the spike protein, inject it to us, and we make antibodies against this protein. An example of this is the Novavax. You might have heard about it in the news this week. Uh, I'm not gonna present data there because nothing is published, it's preliminary, but the Novavax is using this technology. Uh, the second one is, uh, and the third one, the adenoviral vector and the messenger RNA va uh, vaccines are saying, instead of using the protein itself, let's take the genetic code, which is the RNA, which, or if you want, think of it as the building instruction for the spike protein and put it uh, in systems that we can deliver to us and we will make the antibodies. So both of these are, are kind of novel. They, they seem, the platforms seem new especially the mRNA. It's the first time we're actually using it as a vaccine platform. But the technologies, guys, trust me, are not new. There is decades of research with these viral vectors and with messenger RNA for us to get here. In a way, we were luckily had this research because now that the pandemic happened, we're ready, we, have, uh, we know what to do, and we were able to do it this fast. Okay, so I'm going to go into the details of some of these vaccines. So for the messenger RNA vaccine, which is the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines that already uh, have FDA approval, as I said, we are taking the RNA, which is the building block instruction of the spike protein only, and we are packaging it in lipid nanoparticles. The RNA itself cannot enter the cell. We need to package it in something. So we're packaging it in these uh, lipid nanoparticles. And even though they are in this package, by the way, guys, they are very fragile. So just mixing the vaccine tube like this may destroy the content. It is a fragile 
thing, the messenger RNA. So what we do now, uh, we make the, these nanoparticles are going to enter our cell and our cell already has machinery to make our own proteins, right? Our cells also have proteins as well. So what we are giving our cells is just a code to code for another protein, in this case, the, sty the spike protein. As you can see, guys, the messenger RNA remains in the cytoplasm, if you remember biology from high school. It does not enter our cell nucleus where the DNA is. So there is no way that this uh, uh, messenger RNA is going to enter our DNA and alter our genetic code or alter our genes. The messenger RNA can never enter the cell nucleus. Okay, so basically we're giving this code, we are using our own machinery to prepare the spike proteins, and now the spike proteins, just the spike protein, not the rest of the virus, is going to be uh, manifested on our uh, cell surface. So our immune system sees these spike proteins, they are foreign proteins, it has never seen them before, so automatically we have evolved that if we see anything foreign, we form antibodies and we form other immune cells against this protein, right? So we form antibodies, we form memory B cells, memory T cells. So basically we are forming our defense system, our artillery. So we have it ready now. And now if the SARS virus comes and tries to attack us and it's arriving into our uh, respiratory system and trying to get in, our immune system is already ready. We have made the antibodies, we have made the T cells, the B cells, all the nice uh, immune system is ready and revved up. So it will attack it. As you can see here, the antibodies are ready. They will block the spike protein from attaching to the receptor and entering our human cell. If the, vaccine, if the virus cannot enter the cell, it cannot cause damage, it cannot kill the cell, therefore it cannot cause COVID-19. So I hope the concept is clear. And of course, we will take any questions. I try to simplify it as much as possible. So, uh, so now uh, these two vaccines that went into clinical trials and, uh, and went through a very rigorous process, which Dr. Najarian will talk about after me, uh, they uh, actually um, had in the Pfizer vaccine about 45,000 patients and in the Moderna vaccine about 30,000 patients. So altogether 75,000 patients were injected either with the vir uh, vaccine or with placebo last year between August and uh, October. And two things we look at when we are studying any product is, is it going to work and is it safe? So is it going to work? We call it efficacy. So they wanted to see if those who got the vaccine was go were going to get ill with COVID-19 versus those who got the placebo, is there going to be a difference? And lo and behold, uh, and their endpoint that they were measuring, by the way, was symptomatic COVID-19. So somebody who has COVID-19, but is also having symptoms like a fever, a cough, achiness, myalgias, which is muscle aches, uh, diarrhea, and severe COVID-19, which means hospitalization, those who are requiring oxygen, intubation, and death. So they saw that actually those who got the placebo continued having COVID-19 versus people who took the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, look at the difference. So this was a 95% difference in those who got the vaccine versus didn't get the vaccine. If you want to put it in numbers, about eight people in the placebo group got the, uh, sorry, in eight people in the vaccine group got symptomatic coronavirus disease and only eight people in the placebo group. Sorry, eight people in the vaccine group got the disease versus 180 people in the placebo group. So clearly there was a much pr a bigger proportion of people in the placebo group who got the disease versus that in the vaccine group. Similarly, I mean, you can see we, it, when we in science see such big graphs, we really get excited because this is a big difference. So this was the Moderna mRNA vaccine in blue line and the uh, black line is those who got the placebo. Again. 95 difference, meaning in the uh, 15,000 uh, people who got the vaccine, only nine people got symptomatic COVID-19 versus in the other 15,000 who got the nothing, who didn't get the vaccine, they had about 200 people who got the COVID-19. So big uh, efficacy.
So the other thing that we obviously worry about, about any product that we give, whether it's a medication or a vaccine, is the safety. So is there any side effects and are they serious? These are actually real world data that are available on the CDC website. So uh, it's, you know, I'm giving you any everything that's public information. And this is after we started already using the vaccine in people. So this is not the trial data. This is actually about uh, 20 million people up to January 15 who have received the vaccine. And not surprisingly, pain is the most common side effect at the injection site. And you have about 33% of people who had fatigue, about 30% of people had headache, muscle aches, about 22%, chills, 10%, fever, 10%, swelling at the site of the injection, 10%, some joint aches, and some nausea. So you can see that most of the uh, most common side effects are really mild side effects and the majority resolve within one day or two days. And you can take Tylenol or Panadol or Ibuprofen if or when these, you start experiencing these symptoms. What is also uh, good for us to remind you guys is that if you look at the Pfizer dose one versus dose two, there, were, there is a higher percentage of side effects after dose two. And this was actually evident in the trial as well, meaning you might do perfectly well with zero symptoms with after dose one, one, but after those two, you have a higher chance of having some of these side effects. So as you can see, fatigue, for example, after those one was 28%, but after those two, 50%. Same for headache, 25% went up to 42%, 17, 42. So we want you to be prepared that there is a little bit more chance to get side effects with the second vaccine. But again, they last one to two days and you do it as new uh, after that. Now, there, I want to. this came up as a question already in the chat. And we want you to know that in our real-time experience, there have been a small proportion of people who actually are getting warmth, itchiness, and redness at the site of the injection a week or 10 days after the injection. So this is being reported to everybody that uh, Larry is going to talk about to the safety monitoring uh, boards, and we are aware of it. But again, they resolve with some Benadryl or Claritin, any antihistamine and topical steroids. And it is not a contraindication to get the vaccine uh, the second dose if you experience this kind of um, injection site issues even after a week of the injection. So as you can see, all of these are not serious side effects, right? Very transient, mild. If anything, you take a Tylenol or an ibuprofen, you're good. There is something that has come up actually, again, since we started uh, vaccinating masses of people after the trial, and that is what we call anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis, by definition, is a severe but treatable allergic reaction to the product that you are giving. And if we look so far at um, how many um, there has been, uh, it is about four in a million vaccinated uh, people, four in a million. So it is very, very rare. And uh, I, want you to, I want you to see guys that 75% of people who got this experienced the symptom within 15 minutes of getting the vaccine. And 90% of the people, both in the bio, uh, Pfizer and the Moderna, experienced this within 30 minutes of receiving the vaccine. That's why when we give you guys the vaccine, we are having everybody sit down for 15 to 30 minutes of, uh, of observation before going home. Because because if you're going to develop, uh, if you're in the four in a million who's going to develop a reaction, it's going to be within most of the time within 30 minutes of getting the vaccine. So uh, right now there is, um, I want to show you this, that if you have a history of previous anaphylaxis to let's say eggs or food or dyes, it is not a contraindication to get this vaccine. And 80% of the people actually had previous anaphylaxis or allergies. Um, it is not a contraindication, but these are the people who are going to sit 30 for 30 minutes of observation. So those who have no history of allergies whatsoever are going to wait 15 minutes. And those who have history of allergies, just because they have a little bit higher chance of developing these reactions, they're going to uh, sit a little bit longer, 30 minutes. And the, everybody's going to be ready over there, give them whatever they need, Benadryl, if in the worst case scenario, epinephrine injection, and they are good as new. Nobody has died from anaphylaxis, nobody has been hospitalized, or maybe one person out of the 75 had to be overnight hospitalized. 
so I'm done with the uh, Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. And now I want to uh, talk about the other platform, which is the adenoviral vector platform that we talked about as the three main platforms that are in the uh, market or almost uh, in the market. And for the adenoviral vector, we're uh, talking specifically about the Oxford AstraZeneca or the Janssen, Johnson & Johnson vaccine products. So here, instead of uh, doing the mRNA in lipid nanoparticles, we're still taking the, the mRNA, which is the code, if you remember, the building instruction for the spike protein, and we are making use of what we know about viruses. So we are taking an adenovirus, which is a study, it's been studied forever and ever, like there are scientists who spend their whole lifetime studying this uh, virus. We know that it can package a lot of material in it. So we strip it from everything and uh, we put the uh, spike messenger RNA in it so we can have this virus enter our cells and deliver the spike code and then get destroyed. So itself, this adenovirus cannot multiply. Think of it as, let's say, using a car, you push the car because you know it has wheels to deliver something to you from point A to point B, but the car doesn't have gas and doesn't have a, an engine. So it is, it is, you're only using it for its wheels. So we're only using the, the virus to get into the cell to deliver the messenger RNA. So the advantage here, remember I told you how fragile the messenger RNA vaccines were. These ones are not as fragile because the adenovirus uh, packaging is much more robust. So therefore this one does not need um, a freezer. You can put it in a regular fridge. And uh, the AstraZeneca is gonna be two doses, but the Janssen and Jan Johnson actually is a single dose uh, vaccine. So logistically, it's gonna be easier to deliver en masse. And this just came in yesterday. So it's not even published in the scientific journals yet, but um, they released the preliminary results for efficacy of the J&J adenovirus 26 vaccine. And uh, in, in the USA clinical trial participants, it is 75% effective. And even in South Africa participants, it is 57% effective. Because I know so, some of the questions are gonna be about the variants. So yes, it is reduced, but it is not zero. So we have to all remember that some protection is better than zero protection. So 57% is pretty good. And 85% actually against severe COVID-19, which is at the end really what we want. We don't want people to be hospitalized and to die from this disease. So the JNJ has a lot of promise and I'm assuming in a week or two, they will apply to the FDA to get their approval and hopefully have it in the market. So, um, uh, for now, though, as Dr. Hekimian was saying, we still need to distance from others and mask correctly. And by correctly, we mean putting it on the nose, not below the nose. Make sure it's thick. You, if, you, if you can see through the mask, then it is not doing anything for you. So the reasons why we still need to distance from others and mask, even if after we receive the two-dose Pfizer or Moderna vaccinations, are because of the following reasons. Number one, if you remember, I said that the end point of these trials was to see if we can prevent symptomatic COVID-19 or severe COVID-19. So we don't know yet if these vac vaccines actually prevent asymptomatic infection, meaning infection without symptoms. And therefore, we don't know if we can, by vaccination, if we can prevent transmission from one person to the other. That data is going to come, but until it comes, we don't know. So therefore, that's one reason why we need to keep distancing and masking. The second very important reason is, again, most of the world is still unvaccinated. And the virus case numbers, as Dr. Hekimian showed, are still very high. So just because I'm vaccinated doesn't mean, you know, many, many people around me are not. So therefore, I still need to distance and mask. Also, uh, this will come up probably in the question section. I, I can go into more detail then. But remember, it takes two weeks from any vaccine to start kicking in these antibodies being made in our system. So in order to get full protection from the two doses, we need to wait two weeks from the second vaccine. Okay, so that you're looking into a six to eight week process for you to say, okay, I have the best protection from the vaccine. But again, remember, most people around you are still not vaccinated and the virus is circulating still at very, very high numbers. And remember, the best vaccines are still 95% effective, not 100%. And then each time someone new is infected, guys, and this is something, again, we need you to remember, the virus is given chances to mutate, right? Remember, I told you the virus enters the cells, multiplies, goes out, 
enters another cell, multiplies, goes out. Each time it multiplies and it makes progeny, it's, it's possible that that progeny will be different from the parent progeny. That's what we call mutation in viruses. And RNA viruses are notorious for mutating and mutating fast. So we already know that the, there have been mutations in the spike protein. And these are the UK variant, the South Africa variant, and the Brazil variant that you have uh, heard about a lot in the news. So these uh, mutations have already happened. And as I already showed you, for example, for the J&J &J vaccine, it has already reduced the efficacy from uh, 75, 85 to 50, 60 percent. So just this mutation in the spike protein already we know can can cause trouble. So there might be in the future even new mutations, worse mutations that can potentially result in viruses that can overcome and outsmart our defense systems, both the vaccine defense system and our natural immune system. So when we beg you like, you know, we're not really being, uh, you know, anti-social or pol political. We really want to stop the spread of the virus because uh, because of all these reasons to 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 prevent people from dying and to uh, prevent the virus from just having a field day, infecting people and mutating and giving us more trouble. I'm going to say uh, stop here and I'm going to introduce Dr. Najarian. Um, and we'll take questions later. Uh, Dr. Najarian is <laughs> an assistant clinical professor in ophthalmology at NYU Medical Center. He actually is also the founder of a very successful ophthalmology practice, Bedminster Eye and Laser Center, and we're happy to have some of his patients with us today. And he is our president uh, of APO. He is uh, tireless, he works very hard, and is um, uh, uh, leading us in these uh, difficult times. So the uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Celine. That was a, uh, an amazing presentation uh, covering a very complex area. Uh, but I'd like to reiterate uh, one point that uh, Dr. Hakimian and you have made, and that is getting the vaccine is really a selfless act of humanity. Yes, uh, we each benefit from it. Uh, the risk of a serious complication is extremely low versus the risk of death from COVID-19 and serious illness. Uh, but the most, the other very important aspect is by reducing the risk of being infected, we're really helping everybody that we love uh, because it's not giving the virus a chance to populate. It's not giving the virus a reservoir to grow and to mutate. And uh, mutations are something, as Dr. Kodrigwanian said, is extremely common with this group of viruses. In fact, one of the questions that I get when I'm seeing patients is, why should I get the vaccine? It's not going to be good against the next strain. Well, that's not necessarily true. Uh, we deal with this with the flu vaccine. We know the flu vaccine is not 100% effective. In fact, it may be 40 or 50% effective. And that's because there's so many mutations of the flu that we can't anticipate them and develop a vaccine in time for it. However, it still does provide protection. So let's just look at this vaccine. Uh, this vaccine we have uh, is good, let's say, to pick up a series of words as C, spot, run. Well, we have two sentences. You can C, spot, run up a big hill on a beautiful day, or you can say, on a beautiful July day, you can C, spot, run up a big hill but it really doesn't matter how you scramble the sentence. What the sentence has is the key words, the phrase, three words, see, spot, run. This means that this vaccine will be maximally effective. But what happens if you lose one of those words? And we only see two words, see, spot. On a beautiful day, you see spot on the big hill. You still will get an effect of the vaccine. It may not be as strong as if you had three words, but you still get an effect. And now we have a weak effect. If you only have one word, spot, on a beautiful day, spot runs up the hill. You still will get impact from the vaccine. So all three sentences, all three people will benefit from getting the vaccine, some more than others. So getting the vaccine is very, very important. And so far, all of the variants and mutations that we've seen uh, the vaccine is effective against it. Um, what we are concerned about is a, vac a virus or a mutation of this coronavirus that doesn't have any of these keywords in it. Um, and 
what we're, uh, there is a lot of surveillance going on in the research sector, always looking at these new viruses, looking at their genetic basis. And companies like Moderna and Pfizer are looking at boosters to supplement the vaccines that we already have had so it can address this issue. So in all circumstances, you should get it. Now, another thing that I hear very commonly in the office is why should I get this vaccine? Uh, this virus just popped on the scene last February and no research had been done on it. We have this vaccine, it came out of nowhere, lightning speed, it must be a conspiracy to develop it. Well, uh, that's fortunately not true. Um, like everything, we stand on the shoulders of the giants that preceded us. And the technology of mRNA vaccine uh, research actually started in the beginning of the 1990s. And in 1990, it was the first successful use of this technology when it was injected in mice. And that's important. It was not injected in people to start with, but injected in animals. And that's where a lot of this research is done in mice and then 1992 in rats. The first major breakthrough, uh, the second major breakthrough in this technology was in 2005 when Dr. Caitlin uh, Catalan uh, Carrico from Hungary uh, in joint venture with Dr. Weissman from University of Pennsylvania found a way to make the mRNA vaccine or the mRNA uh, technology work without doing harm to the organism that receives it. Um, later on, uh, using based on that research in 2005, the company Moderna was founded uh, with a, a several MIT and Harvard researchers and Dr. Caitlin Carrico herself uh, joined BioNTech in 2013. So what you see here is at least a 30 year timeline in developing the mRNA vaccine. It just didn't happen overnight. And by the way, Dr. Carrico, she was let go from University of Pennsylvania and demoted because they didn't like her research at that time. Now, in terms of vaccine development, what goes on behind the scenes? Well, we just lifted up the screen a little bit by saying, uh, mentioning some of the basic research. And indeed, that's where it starts. It starts with an idea. It starts with hypothesis testing. Does this work? Um, so they first start doing this research, basic research in the laboratory. Um, and then you go into preclinical pre studies. And this all takes years prior to it getting to what's called phase one clinical trials. These trials were done in the United States, uh, but the Moderna vaccine locally was done at New York University uh, in the early spring, where they took several hundred patients uh, and helped determine the dose and safety of the vaccine. Later, it goes to phase two trials that Dr. Kodragwanyan uh, spoke of. Usually these trials have less than a thousand patients. These trials for both the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines were huge. They had over 30,000 for Moderna and 43,000 for Pfizer. These patients were tested very carefully. They were supervised and monitored. What's very important at each stage, phase one, phase two, and phase three, there were independent committees. These committees are beholden to no one. These committees are vested with a lot of power. What they do is they analyze the data real time. If you were a participant in that study, every move you made as a patient would have been monitored by this committee. And if there was an adverse event, this committee has the power to stop the entire drug trial in Pfizer's case for 43,000 people, to halt it and investigate why an adverse ha event happened. And indeed, what we've seen in research on the different therapeutics for the COVID-19 vaccine, COVID-19 illness, is several products have actually been stopped, pulled in their tracks by these independent data and safety monitoring committees. These committees are made up of very experienced people from uh, who do research in this sector. Uh, so we should feel very safe knowing that you have multiple committees vested with this kind of power. During the campaign, we heard that, well, one person can influence this uh, vaccine or influence the FDA. Well, what we see here, there's so many layers that no one individual or group of individuals can influence uh, the course of this vaccine. It's gonna, if it's, or any uh, drug that makes it through this very rigorous process. Now, what we'll talk about in a few moments also is once a drug is approved, things don't stop there. There's continued monitoring. Just how rigorous is this process? Well, we went through all the different committees and stages that takes years to get through. 
But as an example, of every 10,000 compounds or drugs that are initially thought of, only one that makes it through this complex process. So the odds of success are very low. It's truly amazing. It's a modern miracle that we are where we are today in less than a year. Now, in terms of post-surveillance, uh, there are multiple ways that we're monitored. Uh, let's just say that you have a severe adverse reaction. Well, your physician or the people that give you the vaccine will report this to the CDC through the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. Uh, this is a joint venture by the FDA and the CDC that was founded in 1990. Uh, and this system is very, very active at this time. The CDC also has a, a panel called the Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Project. Uh, and these are groups of uh, very specialized healthcare providers who deal with complications. So if you do have an unusual complication, uh, the CDC has these various committees available on call to assist your treating physicians. The local branch of this is located at Columbia University for those of us in the New York area. Uh, we also have the power in our own hands in our mobile phones, our smartphones. There's an app called VSafe, uh, and this is an app that you can download. And when you get your vaccine, what you can do is answer the questions regarding any adverse effects that you have. Depending on your response, you will actually hear, uh, you might hear a response from the CDC inquiring uh, more about what happened to you. So uh, we can feel very assured that uh, these drugs, these vaccines just didn't come out of nowhere. There was a lot of very careful thought, a lot of scientific research, and a lot of surveillance going on even after the release of these products to us, the general public. In addition, Pfizer and Moderna have ongoing studies. So those patients that got these vaccines in the summertime are still going to be studied over the next two-year period to give us more information about the long-term effects of safety as well as efficacy of these vaccines. On that note, I want to just uh, reemphasize the point that um, the basics work. Um, you really do need to wear the mask. Uh, the mask is very, very important um, and wear the mask appropriately. Uh, keep your distance. Uh, and the other thing that people often ignore is eye protection. Uh, if someone should call for sneeze, their virus droplets uh, will go into the air and they can easily go into your mucous membranes. So if you're wearing a mask, it will prevent those droplets from going into your nose or your mouth. But they can also go into your eye and that is a route of an, a potential route for infection. So wearing eye protection is a very good idea when you're in the general public. Having said that, uh, really it gives me great pleasure to introduce a rising star amongst us, Dr. Ani Nobondian. Uh, she's a cardiology fellow at Columbia New York Presbyterian Hospital where she also did her internship in internal medicine. Um, she has a medical degree from Columbia University, the Vagilis College of Physician and Surgeons. Uh, she won a prestigious research training award from the National Institute of Health and is a, did volunteer work in the Armenian Quarter. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Najarian, for that uh, very warm introduction. Um, thank you also to all of APO for this invitation and to all of you for your time and uh, attention to this. Um, and giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, as, uh, as, as Dr. Najarian uh, already sort of hinted at, the, what I'll be discussing today is my experience working in the intensive care units at, uh, at Columbia New York Presbyterian Hospital and giving some insight. Um, I know that over the, the course of the past year, we've all had an abundance of information reported to us um, through the MIA, but also probably unfortunately th uh, through people that we've known personally that have suffered from this disease. Um, but what I hope to offer today is some insight with regards to, um, as a reminder, but also just additional insight into what a profound um, path pathology that we are seeing with COVID-19 and, and how we hope that with this vaccine, we'll be able to mitigate this and reduce um, reduce what we are seeing in the critically ill population. So um, to offer some context as well, you know, as a, as a cardiology fellow in terms of exposure to critically ill patients throughout internal medicine residency training, which is three years, uh, 
I've taken care of many patients in many different ICU settings. And then as a cardiology fellow, a significant proportion of our time is spent in the critical um, care setting. So in the, in the cardiology ICU. As a result of this pandemic, since the spring, I have been in many different ICUs deployed throughout our institution to um, surgical ICUs, neuro ICU, medical ICUs, as well as our critical care cardiology CCUs, which all very astonishingly and very in a very humbling manner um, became quite uniform in the in the springtime, by which I mean that these different ICUs, which would have a very unique subgroup of patients, whether it be you know patients after a surgical procedure, patients after a stroke, suddenly all became patients with COVID, with severe respiratory illness and other sequela of COVID. And it was something that was truly unfathomable for all of us and speaks to the degree of the um, pathology that is associated with SARS-CoV-2. So um, I hope with that, it gives some uh, better sense of my perspective that I can offer from having worked in ICUs and continuously and continue to take care of patients with this, um, with this disease. Um, to ask me, what is most striking, you know, how do we sort of uh, distinguish these patients from other patients that are critical to you? Uh, and we may have heard this term in the in the lay press, but it's um, the proportion of patients that end up with um, ARDS, which is the stands for acute respiratory distress syndrome, which um, in and of itself is a whole topic, but essentially signifies that this is somebody who is in the most profound respiratory um, illness state that one can be in. So not just needing a ventilator, but be that needing maximal support on a ventilator, which means, you know, normally room air has 21% oxygen, um, but this is somebody needing 100% oxygen on a ventilator. And in addition to that, other um, management, um, such as what we call proning and even sometimes paralysis. So I won't get into the depth of all of this or the details of all of this, but suffice it to say, these are patients who um, write med medical training as a medical student, as an internal medicine residency. When we would see ARDS, it was really uh, very memorable and not that common. Um, but suddenly, you know, the proportion of patients in the ICUs with ARDS, it was overwhelming. Um, if I had to also describe what has been very sombering for me to see, um, and again, I actually just saw this in the past recent weeks, it's these, uh, what we call pruning teams. And, and what does proning mean? Um, if you look over to the, the right of the screen here, I have sort of a cartoon taken from my journal. It's an illustration of what pruning is. So here you can see this is a critically ill patient who is on a ventilator. Um, they're intubated, but instead of lying on their back, on their belly, this is what's called the prone position. And most times when patients are intubated, they are not in this position. Patients who develop severe ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, those patients may often need to be proned. And that is just yet another um, sort of a signaling factor to us as clinicians as to the degree of the severity of illness that uh, COVID can cause. Um, so at the peak of the pandemic in the springtime, our, our uh, medical ICU, which is typically where we only would have proning, uh, recognized that you know, there were patients throughout the hospital in different ICUs who needed to be proned. And so they developed proning teams and we would see them coming around to all the different ICUs to prone patients. Thankfully that went away, we, the volume went down. And then in recent, we all know with the, perhaps the holiday as well as the winter season, as the numbers went up, um, it was very uh, sobering to me to see, you know, the reemergence of our proning teams again. Um, then it's also, I would say, if I had to characterize what distinguishes them, these, this patient population, it's the severe and the sort of deep, profound refractory shock in which uh, these patients often are in, um, meaning that they need maximal support with medical therapy in terms of IV drips that we are giving them. And even then, many of them um, went on to develop uh, what we call multi-organ state of not being able to perfuse our organs. Um, and when that happens, then we can end up developing what we call 
or kidney failure. failure. Um, and unfortunately, we have seen that all too often with this, um, where many patients with COVID come in with respiratory distress and need transient dialysis or end up leaving the hospital with, with dialysis. And then um, in addition, I would say there's this very hyperinflammatory and what we call a hypercoagulable state in which patients, um, for a variety of reasons, um, with COVID end up having complications such as uh, clots in their legs or what we call pulmonary emboli clots in their lungs. And, and the this is not uncommon or unusual in critically ill patients, but the extent to which we saw this in our COVID patients was, was and, and does remain rather um, something astonishing. So how does this occur? It's always, in my mind, it's always very helpful to contextualize uh, what we know with what we don't know. And so I would say if I had to be a little bit more familiar with and have more abundance of information on is, is influenza. And so this is just one study uh, meant to illustrate. And again, everything in, in this presentation is just meant to be very illustrative. It can't be as comprehensive as we'd like uh, in the short time span. but. This is a study that came out uh, recently in the Lancet um, Respiratory Medicine at the end of last year. It was a study conducted in France uh, looking at about 89,000 patients and with COVID um, in the peak of the, of the pandemic last spring and comparing the data to the 2018 to 2019 um, season. And what I think that this, this slide very clearly illustrates in this graph here, in the top, we have proportion of patients who received ICU support. In the blue, we have COVID patients and in, in red, and here at the bottom, we have the age of, of these patients. Clearly, we see, um, as we've heard earlier, earlier, wherever there's a separation of very etching and it's meaningful and usually statistically significant, that the proportion of patients or the percent um, positive COVID-19 patients you see a breakaway there that one cannot ignore compared to influenza. And then if we look down on this bottom graph of in-hospital mortality, and as um, you know, the population ages, we see that these two graphs are just totally separating. And we see the in-hospital mortality nearing 40% um, in the older population of COVID positive patients compared to an influenza. So um, what this article to this brilliant points, which I think is really representative again of how different this uh, respiratory illness is compared to others is that nearly twice as many patients have been admitted for COVID compared to seasonal influenza. And, that, and even these graphs are over shorter time periods looking at COVID over two months versus influenza over three months that there are nearly three, three times um, a higher in-hospital mortality in patients with COVID compared to influenza, um, that patients with COVID less is likely to receive um, need to be intubated, and that their stays in the ICU are longer as well, a mean ICU stay of 15 days compared to eight days. So all of that is very striking and very worrisome as a clinician, and of course, this is all still just acute illness. Um, as, a, as a cardiology fellow, of course, um, my interest does lie in what the cardiovascular complications are related to COVID-19. And um, this is, again, just meant to highlight some of the, um, the, the main buckets of sort of complications that we have seen, though there are more. Um, myocarditis, and myocarditis simply means sort of an inflammatory process that would be affecting uh, the heart tissue. And when an individual has myocarditis, they may end up developing what we call heart failure. So a weakening of the heart to be able pump function, essentially. Um, they may end up developing cardiac arrhythmias. Uh, this could be atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, more worrisome uh, cardiac arrhythmias like ventricular tachycardia and uh, as well as becoming very hypercoagulable, uh, in which uh, the result of that might be that they develop what we call DVTs, deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism can then lead to worsening respiratory distress, heart failure, and so forth. Um, so I think what has been very um, 
and remains very uh, thought provoking and remains to be determined with regards to the complications in COVID-19 is how long do these complications manifest? Meaning once somebody has resolved their acute infection, have you know signs of heart failure, they may still have a decrease in their heart function um, ability to pump or they'll have an arrhythmia like atrial fibrillation. But how long can we anticipate that to remain? Um, can these uh, ca cardiovascular complications occur? Uh, who is them recurring and who is at risk of them developing, let's say after acute infection? How do we manage these complications? How can we get these complications, reduce the risk of them? And one other um, aspect that certainly remains to be determined and is there are ongoing trials on this topic is the use of aspirin and what we call prophylactic anticoagulation in people with COVID-19, both in the inpatient and in the outpatient setting. At this point in time, you know, the jury is still out on that. There are still ongoing studies. So there is no definitive data to support that. So uh, so what I do want to say is, although much of what I am sort of my focus and my perspective to not offer an entirely skewed perspective on the ICU or critically care, um, uh, critically ill patient is to discuss that even in the non-critically ill or the non-hospitalized patients, there are now reports emerging of um, patients who have had COVID-19 but remain with lingering effects of COVID-19. So at this point in time, there are now these um, international studies conducted in the US, in the UK, Italy, France, Spain, and China. You can see the number of patients uh, in each of these studies reported here. In addition, not included here are survey studies, which have also been conducted. And these studies collectively have assessed patient symptoms up to six months from their onset or from their hospital discharge. And this is sort of what's emerging in the terminology is that this is post-acute COVID-19 or the COVID-19 long haulers, as you may have heard in the lay press, and symptoms may persist. And these symptoms are wide ranging. They include fatigue, joint pain, shortness of breath, cough, ongoing need for oxygen, um, headache, anxiety, depression, palpitations, and chest pain, and there are yet others. And so I think what this points to is, yes, while certainly with the vaccine, we hope to prevent severe illness, well, we hope to prevent any illness, but beyond the question of preventing you know, patients from ending up in the critical care setting, we also want to prevent that anybody who gets COVID doesn't then go on to have these long-term manifestations, which at this point in time, given the, the abundance of information we do have in multiple different um, settings in different, in different hospitals in different countries and different patient populations suggests that this is true data that we cannot ignore. Uh, so I'd like to just show here, this is an excerpt from a statement uh, put out by the American Heart Association on COVID-19 vaccination, which came out January 15th and essentially is stating that, as you can see in the underlying text, that um, it is recommended that patients with underlying cardiovascular comorbidities should obtain this vaccine, particularly because they are at greater risk from developing severe illness from it. Um, of course, we can never guarantee, nothing in medicine can ever guarantee 100%, as in life, there is no 100% guarantee, but that uh, the risk-benefit ratio is certainly in favor of obtaining the vaccine. And of course, that patients, um, you know, we recognize that patients do have um, other medical comorbidities, other medical conditions, and so it really, if there are concerns, should be a one-to-one -one discussion with their trusted physician who knows them well and has been taking care of them. So to offer some parting thoughts, I would say, you know, vaccination, as we've heard throughout this, um, and as we all well know, certainly there is a societal responsibility um, that there is, a, you know, a collective push towards this. And we all recognize that. We also do recognize that it is an individual decision. But what is uh, very unique about this is that it's an individual decision that we're all being asked at the same moment in time. Get hepatitis vaccination when we're children, where we get a pneumovax when we're older, there's nobody's looking over our shoulder, our, our neighbors, everybody is discussing it at a moment in time. This is being discussed at the same moment in time. So it can make that um, decision of vaccination a little bit more in a way public, it should still be an individual decision, 
each person has to take into consideration in discussion with their physician, you know, what their medical comorbidities are and so forth. But certainly, as we know, time is of the essence. We want to stop the spread of the disease, stop the spread of mutations. Um, and as I've said already, you know, everything carries a risk. And so at the end of the day, uh, there's a risk benefit on the population level, but also on an individual level. And um, certainly what we hope that everybody is always very cognizant of is that, you know, physicians, clinicians, people who are in uh, public health, you know, abide by that Hippocratic Oath and the central tenet of it um, is always, you know, guiding us in medicine and that is to do no harm. And so that is the intent that this vaccination um, certainly will only help our society and help us as individuals. I was saying thank you for hanging out with us. We didn't want to speak for an hour, but I guess we had a lot of information to share with you. So we're going to start by answering some of the, your questions. Uh, the first question I answered during my talk. The second question, which is very important is, uh, and I'm going to group this together. Somebody's saying I received the Moderna vaccine and within seconds of receiving it, I had a severe anaphylactic reaction. My second dose is in two weeks. Will the same thing happen? I'm not allergic to anything else. What I uh, wanted to say is that if you do develop a severe anaphylactic reaction to dose one, you cannot and should not receive dose two. So the, there is very, very few contraindications uh, that uh, someone has uh, not to take any of these vaccines. And this is really one of the two contraindications. So if you develop your anaphylaxis to the vaccine, you should not and cannot get the second dose of the vaccine. It was an amazing panel. Uh, each of you, uh, Dr. Akimian, Dr. KJ Oglanyan, and Dr. Nobanyan, thank you so very much for sharing your Sunday afternoon and coming into our living rooms uh, as we uh, learn more about COVID-19. Uh, this is a public service of the Armenian American Health Professionals Organization. Our goal is to give you the facts so that you can uh, make the right decisions for you and your loved ones. Um, I wanna thank each and every one of you for joining us this evening. Uh, and again, thank you to the participants, uh, to our speakers who were really gracious in spending so much time with us. Uh, this is going to be repeated. Oh, there was another question about uh, how we can view this. How can you share this program with your friends? Uh, we are going to be putting this program on our website, ahpo.org. Uh, it will be up there within a few days and you'll be free to look at it. Uh, we will also email it uh, to our email subscriber base. Uh, if you would like to subscribe, there's no cost for it. Uh, we do send out weekly emails. Much of it, at least lately, has been about COVID, but we cover other healthcare issues as well. Uh, just email us at info at oppo.org. Uh, so really, it was a joy to see so many people with us, many of whom I recognize, uh, friends, family, patients, acquaintances, uh, and of course, our speakers. Have a wonderful evening. Stay healthy. Wear the mask, wear your glasses, wash your hands, and stay six feet apart. Uh, and get some exercise and let's stay healthy together.